Welcome back to Makers on Tap, the Milwaukee Makerspace first episode of The Great Sobering. <laughs> we had a great what time. What time did you guys get to bed? Late. Yeah. 2.30? We were, we were three. Like it was, it was late. So we are at the Iron Horse Hotel with a DJ in the background having the wonderful breakfasts of sobering. And um, we have, who are you? I, Chris. I'm Joe. Parker. Ray. And we're going to try to talk over the uh, DJ in the background, but we were just having a really good conversation, and I was like, it's time to record things. So. Context. We, context. We were talking about being, A, experts in our fields, and how that relates to our jobs. Yes. But also uh, motivation, why we do the things we do, and uh, how we can turn that into uh, meaningful employment and doing things that matter to us in the case of trading life units for money units, which is a realization that I keep coming back to as I you know, change the way I change, trade my life units for money units. So... Um, Chris, you were saying that you wished there was more places in Peoria, which is the semi-small town that we live in. It's the third largest city in our state, but it's still it's small. It's like it's it's very much like it's still behind the times in some stuff. Yeah. And it's there has been some cool opportunities that have happened with Peoria, but it's still just so much like you might as well still be in early 2000s and some stuff like we we just got our first ramen place there. Yes. Which, like, <laughs> and it's thank good. God, <laughs> it's okay, and I like it. It's not like I've been to Japan and had good ramen, but it's, like, still, um, it's still a good, like, it's still good ramen. Yes. But, like, I get digressed. <laughs> yeah. It's, You're sidebarring. It's, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's, like, Peoria is just so behind the times on some things. And so, so yeah, you were diving into. I wish there were more places that could utilize my skills. But here's the deal: you are pigeonholing yourself into a projector technician or projection technician. But the reality is that you are Chris Papich, the dude who can figure out computers, who can figure out networking, who can walk up to damn near anything with technology and deconstruct it to its bare bones and fix it again. And that is a level of uh, technical savviness that all of us sitting here understand isn't the norm. Yeah. So like, I pigeonhole myself into a machine technician, robot programmer, all these things. But the reality is if I go into a new situation, there's a pretty solid chance I'm going to come out of it successful. It's like it, it's it's hard because like for the most part you're right. I mean the way I got into this job and I've said this before was because I literally put on my resume that I was an officer at a makerspace and part of my experience was building 3D printers. And so you're right. Like most of my job is deconstructing and figuring out technical problems on a projector scale, and like I love that. But it, it is it's super intimidating to think because like. You start to think about it. It's like, well, fuck. Like, what am I? Like, where can I translate to? Because we've had this talk recently. Um, so we just had this conversation recently where we were talking about that we both feel intimidated by the fact of going into the industry with not having degrees. Because, like, I do not have a degree. I have, I have a certificate in biblical studies. That is what I have. And boy. Did my HR department freaking laugh at me when I tried to put that on my resume? <laughs> well, but the reality is that Certificate of Biblical Studies, just because that doesn't have relevance in your technical field, what it does say is that you can commit to something long enough to finish it, that you can be taught, you've, you've learned how to learn, yeah, and you can, you can successfully commit to like a, a multi-year thing. It's like, and like every time somebody craps on degrees, I'm like, they, the degree has relevance. The degree, it's 
the degree field, maybe not. Like, I do automation. I went to school for quality. Like, they don't have anything to do with each other, but it was the fact that I had the dedication. Like, that, that says leagues, especially in today's world where nobody can sit through a sentence. So, it's, yeah. I mean, well, okay, yeah. No, let's get right into it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so you were telling us yesterday your whole history among, like, all the stuff that you've done. I'm talking to Parker. Um, like, you you literally, I think you were 12 tequila shots in, <laughs> and you were <laughs> listing all of your, like, fields that you've gone through, yeah. and that's just, like... It go it list through them, please. <laughs> through them. So uh, started out with a degree in entomology. Uh, that took me to Orkin Pest Control. I worked for them for about four years, uh, kind of at the top of my game, and then went to uh, working for the Department of Homeland Security. What so, Homeland Security? so I worked at a um, military post in North Carolina. Uh, that did not have soldiers or anyone living on it. It was pretty much just a depot for anything that went boom and would go from the United States to soldiers overseas. Okay. Um, and our next door neighbor was a nuclear power plant. So it was kind of of the utmost importance that that place that had a lot of things that went boom at any given time uh, was secure. Yeah. Because between our 800 acres of stuff that goes boom and our next door neighbor of a nuclear power plant that would wipe out the eastern seaboard. Um, Sounds so, about right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did that for a while until my ex-wife got sick of, <laughs> of that job. And uh, then went on to, let's see, a small stint driving a semi-truck for Pepsi. A 54-foot trailer. That was fun. I like to drive things. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got in really good shape. <laughs> um, and then uh, I taught myself how to paint cars and ran a body shop, painted cars, fixed auto body, uh, did custom work, and uh, loved that because it was more of a creative field. It, that was key, though. You taught yourself how to paint cars. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. Guys, you guys started an auto body shop. You, you knew how to detail at that point, right? Yeah, I knew I knew how to detail a car really, really well, but everything else was... I didn't know. You, you guys were just like, screw it, all in. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, We're, we're totally. going to start an auto body shop and paint cars. And totally. Like, that's not easy. No, not at all. In, in fact, when, when we first went from detail to auto body, uh, I did hire a painter. We had a painter. You remember him. Uh, Dave. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, it wasn't until I, I remember watching him quite a bit and saying, you know, I could probably do that. I think I could do that. Yeah. I have a really extensive background with color theory. So the color theory, that aspect that you, it is really hard to teach yourself, like that I already knew. Um, it was the actual technical parts of like how to mix paint, how to use a gun, how to, how to feel a blend. Sorry. Um, he quit when I had a brand new uh, Jaguar XF that was the first one sold in Illinois, got scratched on the rear quarter panel coming off the transport, and it had to be done perfect and done now, and my painter quit, and I was like, okay, I can do this, Yeah. and the, the car was so new, the paint code wasn't even, like, the, the paint recipe wasn't even in existence yet. So I called PPG, I called Sherwin-Williams, like all my paint distributors, and they're like, sorry, bro, but we don't have that yet. So I mixed the paint of this silver car, $80,000 Jaguar XF, and uh, mixed it by eye, and matched it, and painted a rear quarter panel, blend into the, uh, the door and the trunk, and the, the customer who bought the car knew that it was scratched. He saw the damage. And then he saw it afterwards and was like, it looks like a brand new car. And I was like, okay, I think I got this. <laughs> I think I can do it. Nice. But So a little bit of uh, 
teaching and learning from other people, but also, yes, I do have artistic talent. Like I drew, I painted as a kid. That was always my first love was art. Science just was a better avenue in college. So similar. <laughs> so I could, you know, <laughs> make money. Yeah. Um, but the older I got, the more I realized that money wasn't my motivator anymore. We talked a little bit about this yesterday that all of a sudden I wanted job satisfaction. It's that tipping point you hit in your life where all of a sudden time, my time is more important than money. Yeah. And so uh, I went through another life change, uh, went through a, a really destructive divorce and uh, decided, you know what, fuck it. I'm going back to school and I, I want to be a hairdresser. And uh, I sold my house to my other best friend, Sam, and everything I owned, and I moved to a city <laughs> that could support that and went back to school, and here I am. Yeah. And, you know, back at the top of your game again. Absolutely. Like, yeah, so... Re reinvention is one thing, but I, I have an undying need to be masterful at anything I do, no matter if it's killing bugs or driving a truck or uh, snowboarding or, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. I, I don't, I don't want to just do it half-assed or like whatever. It's, it's I'm all in. Yeah. If you guys have been listening to the show for a little while, you probably are starting to find a theme in the guests that I bring on. They're serial collectors of hobbies and skills. Yes. And they are serial collectors of skills that they become masters of. Yeah. Every Everybody that ends up being a good friend of mine usually ends up being all in or nothing right. with everything we pick up. And uh, our, our significant others are always like, oh God, you gotta, you're into something new. <laughs> I won't see you for a while. Y yeah, or... I mean, that's, that's or, kind of one or, of the or what, what part of our house are we going to lose now? <laughs> to store your stuff yes but also i think it, i think that's important when you have like a group of friends especially people that are really close to you that you love dearly knowing that going in like yeah. it takes roughly ten thousand hours to master a skill right so that's eight to ten years now you could do it on a lot faster truncated but you know what you're not going to see me yeah. and that's how usually driven we are where you just won't see us for maybe a year yeah and then we're like oh hey how's it going i miss you i love you what like what what happened the past year and <laughs> yeah. then we pick up where we left yeah and it's all good because we understand the drive that we have yeah that it's like you know you need your space to to go do your thing yeah. and i need my space and that's i think that's why we do attract like yeah. people because you kind of have to well, and it's, a lot of people don't understand that. It's important to have that driven support system of people that just get it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, people that like aren't going to be like, well, why are you going to learn screen printing? What's a why? Right. It, it's like, it's important to have people like Chris that are like, oh, you're going to learn screen printing? Sweet. What, what do you want to make? <laughs> and, and like, want to want to dive into the madness with you yeah. and are, are super excited. And, and that's how we were when you came to us and you were like, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to school to be a hairdresser, and we we're like, that's change. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it makes sense. It's yes. like it's the perfect combination. You know, every everything in my life, it was like, okay, at Orkin, I had the science, but I didn't have any artistic outlet. Yeah, and because it was a corporate job, and I traveled for it, and I, I didn't have that. I could have at home, but I didn't have the energy once I got home. Right. Yeah. And then, and that says something. When I was painting cars, I had the artistic, and a little bit of the science, but really, it was more the bad environment. Like I couldn't see myself being sixty years old, working in a shop, deep breathing no. these fumes, and and sustaining that. Um, but uh, hair is is the perfect balance of art and science. Everything that I do is rooted in. Well, if I break these bonds down and I recreate it this way, it's, it's both art and science. It, and the cool thing about being a hairdresser from my perspective, coming from that background, most hairdressers are artistic only and don't have that switch between the two brains. 
And so they don't understand exactly what they're doing. They're just replicating or or figuring it out, but not having any meaning behind it. So now when I teach and I go all over North America and teach classes and I teach to people who've been doing hair way longer than me, I blow their minds because they're like, oh, I never thought about that. Because I'm talking about the science of stuff as well as how that pertains to building, make creating something. It, you just brought up another point that um, is key in people like you, um, where once you master something, you teach it to everybody who will listen. Oh, I share it to it's everybody. Like, it's, it's like, try and stop me from showing you yeah. the things I learned. And I think that's part of the quick mastery aspect is... You know, the easiest way to understand something deeply is to break to it down in a way that you have to teach it to somebody. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, as soon as I pick up something, I, I immediately am like, all right, I need six people to come over here. I'm going to show you how to do this so I can learn how to do it better. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, it, yeah. It's so true. And, like, a lot of our conversation yesterday was us trying to discuss the finding people to teach and finding people that are dedicated enough to want to learn on the level that we want to teach them. Right. You had you had a question before I dive into this world. I mean, well, it, it, and it's just like it's a comment. It's not really a question, but it's really cool to like once you're once you're so into that, you you see your passion, and it's just like it's it, like you're talking about like I I had like fifty fifty in this, and I had fifty fifty in this. But like doing hair has really unlocked the full passion of everything, and I feel like, like we come back to like all the cool things that do it. But it's like that's a hundred percent for me what it is. Is like once you have that passion behind it, and you're like fully invested in it, it becomes a lot more fun to do it. And it becomes like you're okay running around teaching it. You're okay being like I want to learn the science because like you're so passionate about it, and that's like. It's just fucking cool to see that. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. It's also a mindset change that I feel contributed to quick, uh, really great success. Is previous, it was, well, uh, you know, we grew up in this culture and it teaches you uh, go to school, get good grades so you can get into a good college. You go to a good college so you can get a degree so you can get a good job. You get a good job, you meet a girl, you get married you buy a house, you, you do all these things, right? And then, and then you're supposed to be happy with that. And, and then you retire, and then you live your life, and then you die. And at some point, I woke up from that sleep of comfort and being cuddled, saying, oh, wait a second, this doesn't really work for me. I don't really like that plan, that idea. And so instead of chasing the paycheck, it became chasing the mastery of, for myself. Like, I, I know I want to be masterful. And by being masterful at what I do, I affect other people's lives. Yeah. Like, someone comes in to me, and I'm passionate and masterful with my skill, and they leave feeling better about themselves. And, it's, and taking the money out of the equation and just knowing that we live in a world of abundance... If, if I give away my masterfulness and my passion, money comes. And as soon as I detach myself from the money, all of a sudden I had it. As opposed to before, I was always chasing it, thinking like, oh, next year I might get a raise and I might be able to make this much money. And next year, if I, if I work really hard or maybe I throw in a couple odd jobs, I can make this much money. And now I don't... It's not that I don't give a shit about it, because I do, because it allows me to do things that I want to do. But that's not what I'm chasing. What I'm chasing is masterfulness of myself, of being a better person, whether it's, whether it's my, my craft, uh, cutting hair, styling hair, or whether it's communication and, and effectively communicating to a m ton of different people that maybe don't have that skill because that's a skill too that you have to train yourself and learn. It's not something we, are, we innately are born with how to effectively communicate with another human being. Yes. We can talk, we learn language, but language and communication are two totally different things. Yes. So practicing that masterfulness with intention, we talked about that yes. yesterday, 
everything with an intention of being better than it was yesterday. Then all of a sudden, the money just came. Yeah. It's... Thank you. It, it's entertaining to see the change that happened with Parker when he went from uh, where he was as the auto body mountain biking awesome friend dude that he was before he had his major life change to seeing the Parker that happens now. It's, it's very entertaining to go out with you to literally anywhere, the gas station, a restaurant, and watch his social interactions and how they've changed since you've become like a service industry person. Like They were always fun because you're just, well, you can't see him, but he's beautiful. Uh, he, <laughs> he looks like a... You make uh, me blush. Uh, Good what, thing they can't see that. What, what, what's the, who's the dude you look like? I get Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper, yeah. 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 Lot. Yeah. If you put Bradley Cooper in like samurai clothes, you have the the beautiful human being that's sitting next to Jedi. you. So so that happens, and then um, you know he has this like shining personality. So you go literally anywhere with Parker, and there's like two things that happen. One, you get the best service of anywhere, whether it's the gas station, the restaurant, the random place where you had to talk to a worker, because. He makes an effort, an intentional effort to know and respect and recognize everybody. And it's all about building relationships. Yes. And I, you know, I started out in the service industry and we were talking a little bit about this yesterday where I have horrible social anxiety and I'm a a terrible introvert. Uh, I've become an extroverted introvert. Like, I love my uh, alone time where I can recharge. Yes. Because I have to have that because I deal with the public for a living. But that was a survival skill. That was a, I don't have a choice. I need a job that makes good money quickly. I can't go to school and and, um, I was playing football and I, I needed quick money. And the only way to do that was the service industry. Yeah. So I had uh, a mentor that kind of taught me how to do that. And then uh, that in turn kind of taught me that, you know, there's other people that uh, you don't know what their life is. You don't know what they've gone through. And it, it's really easy just to put a smile on your face and watch the smile be reciprocated instantly. Because not a lot of people do that. We're so caught up within ourselves. And we're very selfish, you know, human beings are very selfish, and I can be too, absolutely. But I just realized that my life is so much better when I make other people, like, give them that second of like, hey, how's it going? Oh my God, what's your name? Yes. And, and give them that little bit that all of a sudden that, in turn, just keeps coming back. Yes. When you go to, you know, a restaurant or something and they see you and... and they want to take care of you that much more yes. because you were so nice to them. Uh, it, yeah, it's that, that subtle like, hey, I'm Joe. What's your name? That They're instantly recognized. And um, I know when people do that to me, it just it completely changes my perception of the situation, even if it's going to be a bad situation. Absolutely. Somebody, somebody is obviously mad at me, and they're introducing themselves and asking my name. And I'm like... All right, at least we're going to be humans about this. Right. Uh, (laughs) um, But, like, that is so important when you're growing your network of um, colleagues and friends and friend-colleague people. Like, that is 100% how I have gotten to where I am, is just simply working on interpersonal relationships and finding out how I can help everybody around me and trying to teach everybody the skills that I know, not holding anything back and really sharing whatever. Yep. Now, sometimes that kills me because I'm freely sharing way too much. <laughs> but uh, it's, you know, that that's just how I roll. So it's all or nothing, right? You know, we're uh, talking a little bit about the the essence of of life it's like well yeah we're here for a very short speck of time like what's the point yeah blah 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 but really like uh you know it's different for everybody you take uh you have a 
beautiful family and awesome kids, and, and I do not. My legacy is what I have stored up here from years of doing different skills and, and mastering them and, and things that I've learned. Thank you. Uh, that uh, knowledge to me is like the best thing I can give back to the world. Why would I hoard it for myself? I would rather give it away freely and, and elevate everybody else around me because then good things happen back. Yeah, yeah, I'm Not yeah. doing it for those selfish reasons, but it does really make me feel good to talk about like, hey, this worked for me and, and, it, and my life is better because of it. How about that? And then someone takes that and maybe they're inspired to, to do something for themselves, right? Yeah. yeah, do you guys have anything you want to add? Ray so, does. So I've been sitting here listening to this for like the last half hour now and it's like, wow. Everything rings a very, very, dis a very close bell. Like, yeah, this is me in a nutshell. And I know people that are exactly like this. Okay. I didn't realize exactly how much like this you all were. <laughs> like, yes. It's like, wow, you, you nailed it all. It's all good. But yeah. Uh, like attracts like. You know. I'm Ray. Um, I get to play with lasers and make a living doing that. I make the uh, Cohesion 3D laser controllers, and we also have other laser-related products now. I.e. lasers that don't suck. Yes. Well, that, that's the goal, is to make your cheap Chinese laser no longer suck and actually work on par with much better systems that cost several decimal points more. <laughs> you don't have a microphone. Yeah. 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 Our, uh, we, we work hard to make things better. Yeah. Um, a few, a few of the things that really stood out to me is um, hobbies, right? So, like, I have 27 3D printers, four laser cutters, two CNCs, an entire wood shop, and this is all in my basement and several other rooms of the house, much to my family's dismay. Yes. Um, and uh, besides that, um, I've just resolved that every hobby I have it, it involves gear acquisition syndrome. So, like, rock climbing, for example, I got really into rock climbing. I spent time at the gym. I got outdoors. Uh, we did uh, multi-pitch climbing at the Gunks in uh, upstate New York, and uh, like if you're um, if you're climbing and you have a heightened emotional reaction in the moment, something has gone very very wrong. You should not be having an adrenaline rush while you are climbing for a long period of time outdoors. Right. So th like that was my first time outdoors, and like we were climbing to like you know 210 feet elevation twice with multiple pitches. So, uh, it's like, yeah, you should be really, really calm and composed. And, uh, you know, like this is like with uh, stations and switchovers and things. And, uh, yeah, no, like I found it very, very manageable throughout. And, like, it didn't really hit me until maybe like three days later where I was like, yeah, um, that was awesome. I'm going to do that again. And then the next day and I went and I bought like all the gear for outdoor climbing, <laughs> which was like in the thousands of dollars. Yes. And uh, it is uh, yet to be really used. Cause like I'm getting into it and uh, doing it slowly, so I don't die because I still have things to do for the world. Gear so acquisition like syndrome is a thing. It, it really is a is. thing that I really yeah. have a problem with. And climbing, uh, like at the gym, it's like the single largest concentration of engineers, software, software people, and other people in technical professions. Yes. That like they all get it. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm into camera stuff. So gear acquisition syndrome there. Yeah. So I just resolved that every single hobby that I have, technical work or non-technical, aka else. We'll all have it. So it's like conventional sports and going to the normal gym bore me. So like things I like to do, skiing, boating, in particular kayaking. I was thinking about buying a kayak and I, was, I ended up not doing that. Uh, things not? like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> there yeah, are reasons. It, so you made a point about engineers and climbing. And like I, I think th there's, there's two really specific points to engineers and climbing. <laughs> And I realized the second one, actually, when we were climbing, when you came to Peoria uh, a few weeks ago, um, one, climbing is incredibly analytical. You can break down an entire climb while you're on the ground if you can see all the holds and you're skilled enough. Yes. And uh, I'm not that skilled. Uh, but the second one is climbing is a one of the few things that you can do where you can be entirely broken down in the moment and shut everything else off and it, it kind of forces that while you're on the wall it 
I really hit that point for the first time while we were climbing at upper limits, um, where I was I was on the wall climbing, and I was the only thing that was in my mind was the next hold, where my feet were, and if my knot was good. And like I was, you know, on the wall. I didn't realize where I was in the wall until I got to the very top, and I was like. Oh wow, I haven't looked down, I haven't looked up. It's just been me and the next hold. And this has been a very specific moment that I haven't experienced until since I was like really, really deeply into yoga and doing yoga like eight hours a day for teacher training. I, I haven't been in the moment that heavily since then. So and that's been years. What I'm hearing is I need to come to Peoria again sooner rather than later. I just need to climb more. Yeah, or you need yoga. to come to my, my area where we have a franchise of over 20 gyms in the state of New we Jersey, need, and you need to come here. We need to look up gyms for Earth and go climb at Earth. Okay. So. Well, that's driving for me, so I can bring stuff. Yes. That's good. Um, but I'd like to speak to both of those points. So the first point, yes, it's analytical. Um, and second point, yes, it's just you and the wall. But first, you should, you should be confident in your knot while you're still on the ground and then never think about it again. That is why, like, you know, there's people at the gym. It's like, you know, we're at the gym. I'm not going to die. And I'm like, okay, but for me, it's I tie my knot perfectly every time. Yes. And I do that because I built that habit. I built that habit once. I want to tie my knot. I know, I know that it's good. And then I want to never think about it again because I want to focus on the route. Okay, I just have to get that out there. No, but no, that's good. That, that's an important point. Okay, so the first point. Um, so, like, I don't usually climb in the morning. I climb at the end of a work session. So it, it, it works the engineering brain in, in a different way. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so I've been at work, air quotes, at work, uh, doing, you know, engineering-y thingies and, you know, electronics and customer support and highly technical things and whatnot. And uh, that works one area of the problem-solving brain. And then I'm like, okay. And uh, then I go climbing, and it, it's also working the problem-solving brain, which I love, but in a totally, completely different way. And it also has a workout, you know, with a physical activity aspect component to it, which, again, I don't like playing any sport that involves a ball, for the most part. I'm Russian, so volleyball is a thing that's in my blood, apparently. <laughs> but other than that, most ball sports just, eh, not, not so into it. Uh, but so climbing is like the, the perfect intersection of problem solving, but in a different way that it doesn't have the pressure of, okay, my business is riding on me being able to make this guy's circuit board work, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it works a different problem solving area of the brain combined with physical activity. And one tangent of this is um, when I get down and I'm talking to other people and we're like, was that a good route? And I'm like, oh yeah, that was fun. And like, there's always two definitions to fun. There was like actual fun, like normal person fun. And then there's air quotes, fun, which I call uh, engineering masochism definition of fun. Yes. Where it's like, this hurt so much. Yes. And it was really hard. And, and yeah, like I that was great. impossible and I hated it. Uh, and it was horrible. Um, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm doing it again. Yeah. I, can't, I can't wait until I recoup energy so I can do that again. Let's keep going. Yes, that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the, the first time we climbed together, I, I, we had to get to Makerfest to start unloading, and I kept being like, "Ray, we got to go," and he's like, "No, no, two more runs," and "No, no, two more runs." Every time we got down, it was two more runs. <laughs> it really was. It's also, I have more endurance than you do, which I don't fault you for, but I want to get you to that point yeah. where you can do a four-hour session and be okay. Yeah, I would uh, like to get yeah. to that point. So the other, the other uh, topic is the uh, the disconnect. When you're on the wall, it's just you and the wall. Yeah. And that's kind of amazing. It's just like everything else that's going on, like my brain is clear. Yeah. And it is so cool that I can do that with climbing, which hurts my body in other ways, uh, which I won't get into. But overuse and tendon injuries are a real thing and also yeah. other injuries. So don't overdo it. Take breaks. Um, don't ask me how I know all this. <laughs> um, but it's just a complete disconnect and it doesn't involve substances or uh, other things. It's just... This is my drug of choice. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you get up and the rest of life fades away. And it's just you and that and whatnot. And, and that's it. That's adrenaline. We just need to teach you how to use adrenaline in other fun ways. Yes and no. Again, it's the thing about being calm. Yeah. Like, if, you, if you're wound on adrenaline, like at the gym, if you're, if you're like working on a project, great. But the idea is you can do this and be completely in the moment but in the calm perspective. Yeah. Right, so, so that, that distinction needs to be made, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then, 
I mean, like, there's people that just, like, zip up the wall, and, like, that's a great way to burn a lot of muscle energy super quick. Yeah. And then there's my style, which is, like, all about endurance, where it's, like, you know how to stay on the wall and hang the fuck on. Yes. With proper techniques, like, you're not constantly in a pull-up position. And, like, you can just stay there and, you know, hang out and figure out the next move and not worry about zipping up. Yep. Like, it depends what grade you can climb and what grade you are climbing, and that kind of dictates just, oh, I need to get to the top because I only have, like, you know, 2% energy left versus, no, I I can stay and stick around for a moment and figure out which of the three ways I want to make the next move. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's that. Well, but one other point real quick I want to make is about reading the route. Okay. You know, so uh, I couldn't do that at first, right? This isn't about engineering brain. This is about just hours spent climbing and um, knowing, knowing the different moves and styles and techniques that you can implement. So, like, when I started climbing, I saw all these other people, like, you know, standing in front of the wall and, like, doing the arm movements and, like, a little turn here and there. And, I'm like, I can't do that. And then it took, like, a good maybe six to eight months before I was, like, I have the sight. And, <laughs> and, and really what it came down to is when I was able to learn and implement proper technique with, like, turning and whatnot and, like, you know, having the extended arms and all the different ways to accomplish the, the energy conservation and the endurance. Yeah, yeah. And when you get there and you actually know all the different turns and moves and techniques, it's like, oh, yeah, it's that. And now, like, I'm standing at a wall. I'm like, okay, so it's high reach, right hip and wall, back step three, far right, up two, step over. And, um, like, a person next, uh, next to me is like, you must be an engineer. I'm like, yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, and, like, Honestly, like I even freely admit, it sounds like gibberish. It, it, it's just like me standing there making these hand and foot movements while I'm on the ground and uh, mapping semi-coherent words to them. Yeah. So that just like when I'm up there, I have that mapping. So I'm like, okay, yep, we're at that point. Ste right foot step over. And it's there. Like, okay, yeah, so that actually makes sense, right? Yeah. So it's just... It's just that, and it's that combined with just count and other things, like get yourself to make the move so you don't hang out and burn out. Yeah. And it's just that. Well, things just got really loud because there's a train behind us now, apparently. Apparently. And we've been recording for 40 minutes, so we should cut this. It's been really, really awesome to have you on, finally, Ray. We'll get a good interview with you in a little bit. Uh, Parker just had to walk away, so I'll say bye for him. Um, it's kind of amazing how, like, you know, we're, we're, all te we're all technical people here, and I was fully expecting to be talking about, like, lasers and learning and tech, and, like, no, let's just map climbing into it, because we can talk about tech later. Yeah, yeah. No, and we all climb here. It's a great thing, because, like, literally every... There's so many things that involve, like, maker culture and, maker like, the maker mentality, and it's, like, it's just cool to, like, be able to talk to everybody and be like, hey, what inspires you? What, like, what drives you? What... what what passion do you have? And that's just been awesome. Well, but I like being able to afford my dues at the climbing gym, so I kind of <laughs> have to do the thing. A <laughs> little make bit the money. more. <laughs> cool. Well, hey, um, again, thanks for everybody joining. Um, this has been another just amazing experience from Milwaukee Maker Fair. Um, I don't know when this is going to come up, but hey, like if you haven't been convinced to come here already, uh, take this as another hint to be able to like come up here and hang out because this is it's an amazing experience in Milwaukee and it's an amazing community that's up here um, and whether you're hanging with us or you're hanging with anybody else out here it's going to be a good time so yeah Milwaukee is one of my favorite cities yeah every time somebody's like I'm going to go to Chicago I'm like you should just go to Milwaukee it's better <laughs> in every way <laughs> it's it's amazing out here but all right I will Thank you again. We'll uh, we'll see you either on the next episode or in the next little snippet that we're putting after this, and hopefully you enjoy that as well. This Thank has you been again. the best Midwest goodbye ever. <laughs> the end of the podcast. <laughs>